one report with all the requirements literally took 12 weeks to create it from start to finish. 12 weeks just for one report. But at the same time, we were also working with the client to build out a data lake where we put all that data, this raw data into that data lake. We had a little bit more upkeep in putting the data lake together, but the ability for the end user to report on that data was instantaneously. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at Digital Transformation Consulting Firm, Elevate IQ. If you are a growing siloed organization, you will have puddles of data sitting inside every department. You could also have hundreds of unused reports on top of your ERP system that you might not even be aware of. If you want to avoid growing pains because of data, you need centralized ownership and a strategy with clearly identified systems for their roles and responsibilities. In today's episode, we invited a panel of cross-functional experts for a live interview on LinkedIn who brings significant expertise to discuss enterprise analytics planning. We covered many grounds in this episode, including identifying enterprise datasets, their ownership, and appropriate systems to host them. Finally, we discussed the importance of data lakes and their importance in an organization and how to avoid too many reports on top of ERP systems as they could be expensive. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. Just to kick things off, we are going to be starting with the introductions of our panelists. I am going to be uh, starting with you, Melissa, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. I, my name is Melissa Drew. I'm currently working with IBM. I have 27 years of experience in procurement supply chain, focused a lot with data and analytics. Uh, just recently this year, I was recognized with an international award, the Global Leaders in Consulting Excellence and Influence. Yeah, and I think, Melissa, you have mentioned only one award, but I think you have tons, especially in the AI community uh, and the data and analytics community, the work that you are doing that's going to be phenomenal for today's discussion. Thank you so much for being here. Aaron, I'm going to move to you next. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, Aaron Spool. I'm a partner at Aventus. I say from an experience level, I am a seasoned CFO with a very large data and business intelligence background. Melissa, I'm envious. I actually have no awards to my name. I only have lots of battle scars. And Aaron is being super humble because he writes for Forbes and his insight is always compelling. He's very well known in the finance community, and he has done a lot of work in the business intelligence community. So he brings tons of insight to the panel. Thank you so much, Aaron, for being here. Thank you. Okay, next, Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. Chris Giardini. I'm the president and owner of Turnkey Technologies. We're a 27-year Microsoft uh, ERP and CRM implementation partner. We deal with data and analytics every day as part of the solutioning process. So glad to be here. Okay, amazing, Chris. And you are going to have some of the real-world experiences, you know, what to put inside ERP, what to put inside CRM, and where should data lake be. So I am super excited to discuss all of that. Thank you so much for being here. Tim, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, for coming on today. Uh, Tim Harrison, VP of Sales at Warm Commerce. I've got, I don't know, about 20 years of experience being from the manufacturer side onto the sales side, as well as uh, building a business unit for a publicly traded global company. So, yeah. Okay, amazing. And uh, Tim, your experience from the manufacturing and warehousing is going to be so relevant because you need all of that data for your sales planning, for your sales and operations planning. For So thank you so much for being here. Definitely. All right. So we are going to start with today's topic. Let's just start with uh, talking about what are different enterprise data sets that we need to think from the enterprise perspective, as opposed to thinking more from the system perspective. So when we look at, let's say, the average manufacturer or the distributor 
or retailer, they are going to have a bunch of different systems. They are going to have some sort of ERP system. They are going to have maybe CRM system, maybe PLM system, depending upon what kind of manufacturer they are, maybe POS, maybe e-commerce. So there are always going to be five to 10 different systems. But when we look at the enterprise data sets, the enterprise data sets are going to be some of the data sets that are going to be common across different systems. And the role of analytics is going to be significantly different as well, because that plays a role. So Melissa, do you want to start with explaining why data lake matters, why companies should have data lake, and what are going to be good candidates from the enterprise data perspective for data lake? Yeah, so I I find that in, in working with the, the customers that I work with, when you're looking at the disparate systems, the multiple systems across multiple business units, across multiple geographies, the data lake is going to be truly essential to, to building that centralized storage and repository that holds all of these large volumes of raw data in, in a native format that will allow people globally to be able to access it. This is definitely going to be a centralized repository of different uh, disparate systems that you might have. So if you're looking for that, uh, the data lake is going to be super important. Did you have anything else to add there? No, I was just thinking of a story. I, I would, you know, I'd walk in and and, and you know, one of the, the first steps that we're doing is we're going to build a data lake. And so, you know, the the concept of the call that we're going to have today is, is great because it's going to touch on all these topics that that always come up every single time you get into into this footprint. Where's the data? Where's it coming from? Who's going to who's accountable for it? How are we going to maintain it? How are we going to monitor it? What file size? What's it going to look like? Structure? This is going to be a great call today. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much Melissa for that. Chris, I'm actually going to move to you. Do you want to touch on I mean see you have been doing this for 26 years. You know data lake exists there for a reason. Okay? Especially if we talk about from the traditional sense when we had two different systems, your traditional systems, and then you had to build some sort of reporting systems, because if you don't do that, then your operational systems are not going to perform as much as you want. And we had tons and tons of limitations back in the days, and then we had to build some sort of ETL layer and then build the data lake. So from your perspective, what is the role of data lake in a company? Sure. Uh, great point, Sam. So, you know, if you think, and Melissa made the comment, it's, you know, that centralized aggregation point and, you know, to, to really, where is the single source of truth? And I think as you, you identify is the requirement, larger enterprises is the different siloed systems. And again, even if they're consolidating different locations, people on disparate systems, but, you know, a data lake and a, and a common data warehouse gives people that aggregation point. I've even got customers that are integrating multiple systems instead of integrating each system into an ERP, they aggregate into a data lake. So again, essentially that that becomes the single source of truth. And and to your point, you also move some of those workloads off the back office systems, which honestly, not all the data belongs in there. I think that's the other point. As you look at is the data that you're aggregating, not everything fits here, not everything fits there. And um, and I think that that substantiates the use of that. But performance, user experience, and again, you, you get the controls that you can you can build around that application. And if you change the peripheral systems, again, think about all the premise reporting. It doesn't change. It all still stays the same, even as back office systems or other systems could change. So you get some consistency, you get predictability, you get performance. Like I said, there's a lot of rationales to, to move in that direction. Okay, amazing. Some great insights there. And I am going to add or build up on what he just said to make sure that this is not going to be confusing for our listeners. So some of the terms such as, you know, when we talk about centralized or single source of truth, sometimes they could be confusing. Because if you actually talk to my ERP guy, they are probably going to talk a lot about single source of truth. And ERP is probably going to be single source of truth. Now we are talking about data lake here. And today also, hey, single source of truth. Great. But let's talk about why single source of truth matters and where that is get, going to be relevant. So in this particular case, when we talk about data lake, data lake is really the reporting system or the analytic system. It's not meant to be your operational system. The real difference between your operational system and the analytic system is going to be the operational system performs your transactions for your business as opposed to doing the, the analytics or reporting. So in this particular case, the notion of single source of, of truth is going to be write once, read multiple times, okay? That is going to be relevant only in case of your operational systems and not in case of your data lake. So here, I want to make sure that we are distinguishing 
between the single source of truth when it comes to the ERP or having those disparate systems versus the actual data lake, which is used slightly more for the reporting or for the uh, for the analytics. Okay, Aaron, you have a comment. Go ahead. So real quick, just so this is the first time I've ever actually heard the term data lake versus. So what's the difference between a data lake versus a data repository versus a data warehouse? Or is this just a new fancy term? Honestly speaking, it's kind of a you new know fancy just, term. Exactly. <laughs> okay, just <laughs> okay, uh, Melissa. Okay, go ahead, please. I mean, Melissa is going to disagree with me. I'm just, I'm just joshing, it, it, there's more to it. There's more to it. Yeah, no, I I actually think, and and I agree with you. I think it was a fancy term maybe three years ago, but I think there's a true definition between the data lake and the data warehouse. So the data lake is where you have all this unstructured data coming from multiple areas of the system, you know, the company into one repository. And yes, you can report straight out of it. I don't want to I don't want to delve into this more because we can talk about you can talk about what we're actually using the data for and making sure we get right reports and analytics. But I I don't want to get into then why would I have a data lake when I should have a data warehouse if I want to actually structure that normalized data that's only stored once in appropriate tables that are clean and following the Kimball system. But I uh, threw out a lot of words there. I, I would stick to, uh, but I that that's why I'm kind of I. But I I get it. Look, unstructured data is becoming more and more common, and you need a way you need a way to source it and tag it in order to be able to report on it. But is there a translation layer then between the data lake? Yeah. So to me, the the data lake is where everything just you know imagine you have a big pipe. You know, I'm good with metaphors, right? So there's a big pipe, and all this data is being pushed somewhere. So when somebody wants to report on something. You know, maybe you use a little bit of AI, you use some other, you know, systems that could go in there and retrieve that data, um, maybe move it, you know, do some, um, uh, some some work to that data, manipulate it. That way you actually have something. But what I'm finding in, in, re in reality is that very few companies actually have data lakes. They have a lot of data puddles. They have data puddles here, they have data puddles there, and they're trying to link all these puddles together with these little tiny pipes. Um, so I could see where the benefit of data lake is, is that as somebody that's a, uh, looking from an analytical perspective, looking at all this data in one lake, I, I can see what this lake looks like, how big it is, you know, the color, the depth, where it's all these little puddles, it's really hard to work with the data. You don't know, you know, when, when it comes to single source of truth, there is no single source of truth when you actually have all these little puddles other than whatever somebody said, this is the single source of truth. And there's assumptions to that. So yeah, I don't know if that helps at all, but that's, all right. that's my way of kind of framing it up. Thank you. So data no, lake is just a uh, fancy I, other term for warehouse. We need to get this out of our way, to be honest. And I'm actually going to ask Chris because he does a lot of work overall in the Microsoft world. And I am pretty sure he is probably going to have insight. But I am going to offer some more explanation from my perspective so that it helps everybody. My understanding, and again, I could be off here, the data warehouse was more of from the traditional sense where you had relational databases you did not really have the unstructured databases back in the days. That's why it was called sort of the data warehouse where you would just bring this data and you can probably report just out of it, right? But in the modern world, we are going to have a lot of raw data, a lot of unstructured data, the way Melissa mentioned. So now what you need is you need a programming layer on top of that as opposed to simply straight reporting, which is going to be your Hadoops of the world, which is going to be your whatever you are doing from the from the AI perspective, machine learning perspective, that is going to sit on top of this unstructured data. And that's why you are sort of dumping everything in one lake and then trying to get insight from that. What would be your perspective, Chris? Uh, is data lake bigger than whatever I, I described? Yeah, in fact, you know, and I guess it's going to vary based on whose lake you're talking about, because the, you know, the the data, the Azure data lake. I mean, it's it's a lot more than just a, a a bulk unstructured storage. I mean, really, it works with the Azure Synapse Analytics. It works with Power BI Data Factory. I mean, it goes everywhere from you know just cloud big data and advanced analytics, but everything from data prep to interactive interactive analytics on large scale data. So I mean, there's a lot more going on in there. From a services and extension standpoint, it's not just a blob of the data sitting there. So really, if you go from here, from raw to up, in fact, I know on our big ERP platform, Microsoft's moving the whole thing into data lake. So it's all going to be sitting there right out of the box. So, you know, we've got people saying, oh, I'm going to build a data warehouse. Well, you don't really need to because them moving it to data lake is just the first start. I mean, there's probably missing data, so you could continue to add to that. But I think that the services that surround a data lake and in the Azure platform, there's a lot more going on in there. 
not just not just unstructured. You're not. Oh, I don't. The layers are all there. You know, from uncomposed to fully composed to advanced analytics. Um, so I, I think it's going to vary based on you know whose platform you're really building that on, and how much is out of the box versus am I start from scratch? Again, we live in a world where we're not starting from scratch coming off of our ERP platform. But I could see some organizations, but still think if they go up there and they contract, and they buy Azure Space. You're right, they're building from scratch, but all the tools are in that one place. I think is the point. Yeah. So I guess adding to your point, uh, it's not just the fancy word. It's going to have a lot more tools overall to do a lot more with the data. So if you look at the traditional data warehouse platform, they did they were not as capable of doing what you can do today in these data lakes. So that's why, I mean, it's not just a fancy word that we are simply rebranding or renaming this. Uh, it's definitely far more capable in terms of gleaning the insight, combining many different data formats and producing analytics. But the overarching purpose is still the same. It is really for the analytics or the reporting. Your analytics needs in 2021 are far more than what you had, let's say, in 2011 or 2001. So let's just say I would I would let's rephrase that your analytics needs are exactly the same as they were in the past. You still had the need. You just didn't have the ability to obtain to to address that need. Well, so depending upon how you you look at it. Right. I mean, depending upon the competition. So I don't think the competition was as fierce back in 2001 or 2011 because they did not have access to that data either. So you didn't really need as much analytics in 2001 and 2011. But you need that today. If you don't have that, then you are probably going to be out of your business. So, so I, <laughs> I, I would think that you know, data lake is going to be probably a need, especially for businesses that are going to be slightly more consumer centric. When you talk about these fashion brands, when you talk about retail brands, when you talk about automotive brands, and Melissa, you do a lot of work in the automotive space when you talk about these consumer preferences. For them, the consumer data is going to be critical because they cannot make phone calls just like your B2B. Uh, and find out what customers are doing here. We are talking about millions and millions of consumers, and they all have their data that is going to be combined with many different data sets that could be internal or external. So, so let me ask. So let me on this note. Let me ask a question. So, if you have a traditional data warehouse, theoretically, you have good data governance. Data is only stored once. You theoretically have a single source of truth. If if it's if it's if it's managed well, I mean, master data management. Say you have really good master data management. You have the you know, appropriate key. So, uh, so being able to now, you might you might suffer on square, query speed. I can see the argument for data lake if you got a better query speed, but you have that data governance there because each one of these systems is managed by an owner theoretically and should be. Each yeah. metric is owned by a very particular owner who knows how that metric should be used and defined. But if you throw everything in my mind, all I can envision, and I could be utterly wrong, the concept of data lake frightens me. If I if it's how I think, if you're throwing a whole bunch of data into something, like who owns it? How do you know it's right? Maybe there's maybe I'm missing something in here because all I'm thinking about is like, oh, we're just going to shove a whole bunch of stuff into this thing. And we're going to report off of it. Now, I'm, I'm probably entirely wrong in that, but uh, the fear runs strong in this one. So, so Melissa, you, I think you raised your hand. So where, what, what am I missing here? I was going to ask, when has anybody last created a report in SAP? How long did it take you to actually create that report in SAP? So I just recently, um, early this year, worked with a team of people where our entire job over the course of nine months was to do nothing but create reports in SAP. One report with all the requirements literally took 12 weeks to create it from start to finish. 12 weeks just for one report. But at the same time, we were also working with the client to build out a data lake where we put all that data, this raw data, into that data lake. We, were, we had a little bit more upkeep in putting the data lake together, but the ability for the end user to report on that data was instantaneously versus 12 weeks to create that SAP report. So for me, just from my experience, I see a huge difference in the impact to the end user between trying to create that report in SAP and integrate all the data to get it into SAP, no offense to SAP folks, versus you know creating a data lake where we can pull all the data into a central area. Well, that's well, that's... That's a reporting layer discussion and reporting tools discussion. Um, I was going from a data governance perspective. Sure, I, any tool that you use, it could be, it could be PeopleSoft. You want to do HTML. You, could, you pick a whole bunch of tools that have their issues. But the one question I have, was that SAP report correct? So I, I'm, just, I'm just asking from a, from a pure data governance perspective. How do you, I, I understand how data warehouse is governed. Mm -hmm. I understand master data management from a data warehouse perspective. 
how is that done in a one central spot from a data lake? Unless I might, my fully understanding is how does the data get there? Is it, is it governed before it gets there? Meaning that it's from a piping perspective. And so what we're really talking about here is a sourcing of data in an efficient reporting layer. Uh, and so you can get it from, you call it one source or one table that you get everything from or whatever like, but you're talking about an efficient reporting system. That's, that's what it's sounding like. So basically what you, what you create is a really nice reporting tool. And I'm not, I'm not trying to downgrade this. It's great. Heck, if I could get, if I, if I, if I knew all the data fields that I could get and I knew they were right and I had the definitions of them and I had, a, and I had clean reporting tools in which I could pull stuff off, that'd be great. Um, and granted, we're all in companies that we try to do that as best as possible. And we all have our problems. So I think we're talking about you know, two things. One, there's the actual data management from a data lake. The reporting tools put on top of that is kind of a different sphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess Melissa really had a very strong point. And I, I'm actually going to come back to you and about your point that you just mentioned. So the point that you mentioned about this doing this report in case of SAP, and we don't have to mention a specific vendor here, but any report in an ERP system is probably going to take longer time. And the reason why it takes longer time is because you have to care for the rules that ERP system is going to have. But if you are going to do the same thing in case of your, your analytics or the reporting system, it's going to be easier because you don't have to go through the same rule that ERP system complies with. In my mind, if I look at these two systems, ERP system is your operational area where this is where your business happens. Analytics is your play area. Nobody cares whether you have the data governance there or not. So I think we are mixing these two terms. So when we talk about, even though we are going to cover the data governance, we are going to cover the data ownership in this uh, session just because it's all about data. But overall, if you look at the MDM, MDM, I don't believe it is relevant in case of your data warehouse or data lake because MDM, what that provides is it's going to be just one record for your entire enterprise when you are dealing with a customer, what you want to make sure is if I have the customer, that is going to be the same customers across five different systems. Sure, your data warehouse can actually read the MDM as well so that you are not reading a completely different customer and you are making sure that you are combining that. But that is the MDM is overarching strategy from your enterprise perspective, but your data warehouse is simply a consumer of your MDM data. Now, let's talk about data governance. Data governance is more relevant, I believe, in the operational area. It's not going to be as relevant in case of your data lake. I don't know. Chris, do you have any thoughts, any comments there? Those are fighting words, Sam. You know, the, the risk the risk of bad interpretation of data is a huge risk. So as okay. you go back to governance, but anyway, that's that's just, it, it is. And, and it doesn't matter where it's at. You know, the ERP systems are going to have better controls, but once you get into the data warehouse or even a data lake and its composition, there still has to be governance and rules to ensure the integrity of the data and the, the verifiability or the reconciliation. Because again, you got all these consumers out there. And again, you made the comment that there's they can do whatever they want. I don't necessarily agree with that. So I think there needs to be controls over validation. We've got an example where a customer wants to aggregate 270 locations into a data warehouse and then feed the ERP system. And again, the, the criticisms are, okay, how can we ensure the integrity of the data and that it doesn't change, that it doesn't move and, and to control it, to lock it, to, to write back. And there's a, there's a lot that can be surrounding that. So. So Sam, I'll give you an example, exactly what okay. Chris is saying, right? As a CFO, I'm going to produce various different reports. Yeah. Right. If I produce a report and the business unit says, that's not my number, yeah. Or the sales team says, that's not my number. Yeah. Or the operations team says, that's not my number. In fact, that's yeah. not my inventory. Yeah. One of us, most likely me, has lost legitimacy. Yeah. And then therefore, the entire conversation is derailed. So it, data governance is not only just making sure that the, the bit count is the same when you move yeah. things over from an ETL perspective. It's exactly as Chris said, is the interpretation of that data. MDM is more than just is the is the accuracy correct it's also is the usage correct yeah and you guys are absolutely right so let me reposition my my position now okay so so basically what you guys are saying is your analytics and the reporting that you are producing out of your your system needs to be accurate and it needs to be a real reflection of what is happening in the other system that is absolutely right i'm not saying that but what i am saying from the erp perspective what makes erp systems difficult is when you are performing any of the operations it has to go through millions of rules. And that is going to be, okay, is the transaction going in the right period? Is it committing on the same date? Is it uh, you know, going to the right warehouse? It is 
so these are the business rules that are performed as you do these transactions. That's what makes the ERP system so mm-hmm. difficult, even for reporting, because they are not really designed for analytics. Analytics as the development practice is a very different play. They are designed for analytics. They are designed for reporting. You can do any sort of SQL joins in that, and you can produce any report you want. The system is never going to error you out. But in case of ERP, it will. So that's why you have old school data warehouse, which is taking all that data, putting yeah. it in a place so you can report off of it. You want to call it a data lake now versus a data warehouse because you know it, it using a different piece of functionality. You have you have a reporting later and a reporting tool. Whether whether this is in the the mid two thousands and we call it the re- uh, reporting layer, or we're talking today, we're calling it data lake. Granted, you know you so you've increased queries. Fantastic, I, I'm personally thrilled. But the principle is exactly the same. But just to align ourselves, the one of the component of data lake is going to be your data warehouse, okay? And it's going to have different rules from the analytics perspective. And that's where those big data layer, big data rules layer, for example, Hadoop, the reason why you are doing programming on top of unstructured data to create all of those rules that are going to be relevant for your analytics. And I'll give you an example. For example, let's say if you talk about the audit history for some of the regulated industries, for example, your operational system is not going to have seven year worth of data, you don't want to keep it there. Because if you do that, then your system is going to be slower. So what companies do is they are going to move this data to something that is not as critical for your business, because your operational systems are going to be backbone. So what they do is they are going to move all of this data, and they are going to keep seven to 10 years, 15 years data. And that's exactly what Enterprise Data Warehouse did. So let's say if you have to do the reporting for your sales history for last 10 years, and you want to analyze that, your ERP system is not the best for that. In fact, it's actually going to slow down your ERP system if you kept so much data, because what ERP system need to do is it needs to go in the, that 10-year data to be able to find whatever you are looking for today, right? So that's where the difference is, I guess, overall from the data warehouse perspective and also from the operational perspective and where the data lake is going to be in the architecture. Now, let's move to the, the data sets overall. So what are some of the data sets that are going to be relevant from the from the operational perspective as well as from the analytics perspective. Melissa, do you want to start with that? What are different data sets that companies should be looking for? How to determine the ownership? So I know that you mentioned you had mentioned that the ownership is typically not clear. So what yeah. is the right framework yeah. to define the ownership of data? Yeah, so I I'll walk in, you know, and, and talk to a group of people. And the first thing we talk about is, okay, what's the architecture? Who's building the architecture? Yep. Who, you know, what data is coming in from where? Yeah. Who owns the data in, in the systems? Who owns the data that's being sent into the data lake? Who owns the data in the data lake? And the first thing that happens is everybody steps back and the person who's left standing is somehow volunteered as the owner. And, and the very next question that comes up is, what do you mean by ownership? Yeah. So I know, Aaron, you're talking about, you know, just fancy terms, but we actually change the conversation now. We... We don't use governance. We try to use data management. We don't yep. talk about ownership because nobody wants to own anything. We talk about accountability. Who's got the accountability of that data? Who's accountable for it? Because when you think of data on an enterprise basis, there's a lot of touch points with that data. You can't have one owner that owns everything. And when we talk about a data stewardship, it's not really a steward, you know, because that steward is, is you know, the, the, the boat, you know, on the boat. It, it's more about the leadership of the data. So I think that's one of the things that that when you step back and start looking at, um, I'm looking at Aaron. He's like, I think he's shaking his head. <laughs> I I put it this way: There's who owns who owns the concept of a customer. How do you ensure that the the use of a customer is the same in your CRM? That's in the same in your commissions calculation. That's in the same in your revenue recognition. Who who's going to own like, who's going to own the analytic that's going to appear in the 10K? Who's going to own? I mean that there's a there's there's legal SOX compliance. So there are owners. Now there might not be owners for everything, but I'll put it this way. It says, and I, it, 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 Sam's heard this before. I'm the only one going to jail if the data is reported wrong in a public filing. Listen, you're not going to jail. Chris ain't going to jail. Tim and Sam ain't going to jail. I'm going to jail. And I don't want to go to jail. So there are owners, or I'm not going to sign off as the, the official K, the K or the Q that I'm legally required to by Sarbanes Oxley. So there are owners. In fact, the auditor is going to come in and they're going to say who owns what. They're going to say, yeah. how can you attest? I have to attest that this is correct. So, no, I, I told, by the way, I agree with you 100%. Don't understand. From a 
leadership management perspective of getting people to understand. But in the end, how do I know that this metric is right? How do I know that it's used correctly? How do I know that it ties back? How do I know that it's secure and is not suddenly overwritten and backdated? How do I know that if I'm trying to do a comparable analysis or that my investor is requiring legally by SEC law, how do I know that it's right? Who owns that? At the end of the day, two people sign off on that, the CEO and the CFO. Mm -hmm. So technically we're the owners, but there is, there has, and now, now you might say, and by the way, if I had to choose between one of us to figure out actually how to manage data, it's going to be you flat out. So if, if there's management techniques that are able to get people to say, okay, we got to make sure this is right. But at the end of the day, how do I know if I pull a report and I pull a division report and everyone in the division pulls their own division report and I add them all up together and it doesn't equal the entire corporate report? We got a problem. Something is broken. And as Chris exactly said in data usage, or or what happens if we both using a different metric as we're appearing on a report? And I say the word yield and you say the word yield. We're in two different groups. But we're using a different equation. So what is yield? So I, I know I'm going down into the issues, but how do I know that my usage of said piece of data is correct? Uh, Melissa, do you have any, any follow-up comments there? I want to make sure that you are able to address those. No, I, I appreciate that. So I'm, I'm looking at, at building the data in the data lake, which I agree with you. Some of that data is being used to support some of these public, you know, public domains. But ultimately, the, the end of, there's, there's people that are accountable for getting the, the data from the systems into the data lake. And then there's a group of people that are accountable for the data in the data lake. And if you're the individual who's pulling data from that to support a public report, there have been methods and structures and techniques that have been put into place to ensure the quality and the accuracy of that data is intact so that you feel as the owner, as you pull that data out, that your confidence in that data is, stays intact. Uh, Chris, you had a comment, so go ahead. Yeah, one one adder just in the design and architecture of the system, a lot of times, Aaron, is we'll create a, a reconciliation loop to empirically verify that the data warehouse matches the financial system. Now, that's that's challenging when if I'm aggregating a bunch of financial systems, how can I verify that I don't have some loss factor there? But normally we've got a group that, in fact, they do that. There's a little bit of a bulk sync. It's almost like a hashing algorithm that says, yep, we're still good. We haven't drifted. There's no disparity there. So, so uh, But there's also a, a governance over the reporting layout. So I, I'll go back to that. If we're giving people that autonomy to create reports, to your point that somebody needs to come through and sanction those or approve them because before they're used for decision making. Because I think that's the that's Completely the problem agree. is we had somebody order a half a million pounds of steel once because it was a fat finger on a number. And they're like, OK, who needs a half a million pounds of steel? I uh, completely agree. So there's two, there's two parts of governance that you mentioned. This is one is usage of said data. And the second one is most I do. There is an owner for how did that data get entered in the first place? If I'm doing any type of decision making, there has to be an owner of how that thing got in in the first place and the cleaning and the making sure that's right. If you really look, if you think about it this way, if we're making a ton of decisions based off of POS, who's actually entering the data into the POS? I will guarantee you it's probably a line worker yep. who doesn't know that, guess what, if they, and they're just jamming something in there because they're trying to, because they're moving something down the line. But now we're making multi-billion dollar decisions based off of data done from a line worker. So there is, there ha I, I, I am sorry, I, I get back. There has to be ownership, has to be ownership in every, as I used to look, I used, this is going to full disclosure. I used to be an NYPD and we had a thing called chain of custody. Every time a piece of evidence left one, one officer's hands and went to another, there was a sign off and there was a chain of custody. And so basically by the time it got to the evidence locker, you could see so what was in the evidence locker? What was the initial officer that is to it? Is it the same? It's a really old school method, but it's exactly what Chris talking about from, from a hash perspective. There has to be owners. Okay, amazing. Tim, you had a comment, I guess. Oh, I'm just taking all this in. But, um, you know, I can really relate to Aaron because um, I had to report out, you know, our business unit results to Swiss Germans and the data had to match down to the penny. There could be no rounding error. There could be no dis discrepancy between the numbers. And, you know, the, you know, I can really relate to, yeah, you know, the, the <laughs> recognized revenue has to match up with the commissions and going, you know, between the P&L and balance sheet, everything needs to reconcile. So it's really important, I think, that the business unit leaders that are reporting these numbers, they have to take ownership of it. And then they also, there needs to be, a, you know, just like back when you're young, you're doing math, you have to check it. You have to check your work and it has to be constant. There needs to be a consistent loop of checking the data, making sure it's accurate, making sure the reporting is accurate, making sure everything just rolls back up. Because otherwise you do, you get, end up with people making bad 
poor di- business decisions. And, you know, for example, talking about, uh, you know, using the word yield, you know, and people from different groups, you know, say basically they're saying the same word, but doing, you know, they're meaning something different. I had the opposite. I had the opposite. I had people saying um, sales versus revenue and this bookings versus revenue. And, and you know, when there's a, a cultural difference, that gets even more compounded because 100%. It's just, it's really hard to convey, hey, this is what we're talking about. And you could spend hours talking about a report and how they think they perceive it as being really bad. And then it's like, oh, wait a second. No, no, we were just, we we're on the wrong page. Yeah, um, you're 100% is sales versus bookings versus actual recognized revenue versus collections versus collectible yeah. revenue, all this. And, and it means different things to different people. Uh, yeah. 100%. I, I'll go back to, and this is, this is, I, you know, I'm highly opinionated and highly biased. That at least is very consistent. Nothing beats data governance and data usage. It says, yeah. how many times have you pulled a report and you used the wrong field and the wrong table in, or, or used the field and a table incorrectly? Oh, yeah. I do it every day. Yeah. And I'm a professional. <laughs> so, so, so uh, hey, Sam, so yeah. help bring, uh, I think you asked the question about, you know, what are the data sets that we're, yeah. we're looking for? I, yeah. you know, um, to help reel this all kind of into that same direction, back to that direction, I believe there's, you know, internal data and data sets that are required to run the business. And then there's the external data sets like yeah. your customers and, you know, things that are coming to you from outside the organization. So I'd like to kind of, you know, kick kick that over to you guys that, you know, hey, what about those? Well, to, to me, hit it. So there's, there's as, and, and Sam, kind of what you mentioned with the ERP system, there are specific data for specific processes. Yeah. So if I'm producing something, Right. And I'm actually in a manufacturing line. There are certain pieces of data I need and that needs to be highly accurate. Taking all of that data in the historic and Sam, you're absolutely right. I don't need that for seven years. I need that to make the car. Yeah. I need that to manage my warehouse. I need current inventory. The historical data and the like, absolutely. You put it somewhere else. Call it a data lake. Call it a data warehouse. Call it a you know data repository. Call it a data desert. I don't really care what you call it. <laughs> call it a place in which I can get it and that I know how to get it. Because at the end of the day, we all want to do the same thing. We all want to be able to grab some data, know what, know what, how it how it came about, what it actually is I'm looking at, because I want to answer questions, and I want to I want to be inspired by certain questions. I want to ask more questions based off the the answer that I got, and okay. be able to do that appropriately. So there are certain data data sets that are going to be slightly more critical because they have a lot more implications than the other data sets. Okay, so let's say if you talk about some of these data sets because they are going to be used by multiple systems, they are going to have far more implications. And you have used this term called master data management. There is a reason why it is called master data because that master data is going to be critical across the systems that you have in case of your enterprise. When you talk about the data ownership, you are talking about ownership of that data. Some of the examples are going to be, for example, let's say you have vendor number one, vendor number two. Okay, and it could be, I don't know, maybe Walmart, Walmart Inc., Walmart comma hyphen Inc. From the system perspective, these could be three different vendors. And if you don't have the controls placed across the systems, they could be completely different customers. They could have completely different state in those systems. And you as a company might lose a lot. And that's where your data ownership and data control comes in. I also agree with Melissa's comment to some extent. I know that, Aaron, you are worried about going to jail. I appreciate that. But there are a lot of CFOs who don't even know a word about ERP. Okay, they never even touch a, the ERP system, to be honest. Okay, they don't go to jail. See, unless you are doing any sort of misdoing from your part, you don't go to jail even if you are a CFO. I don't know if IT people are going to jail. I mean, I've written some of the CFA exams myself. And I can tell you this, unless you are doing misdoing from yourself, you are not supposed to be the IT person in the organization. You are supposed to be the finance person. If you are provided the wrong data, you don't go to jail. Somebody else does. I don't know who that person is going to be. Maybe CEO. You don't go to jail as a CFO. Okay. So, okay. Let's talk about the master data. Master data. What are different data sets that are going to be critical from the ownership perspective? Somebody, I'm actually come back, going to come back to you. So I know that ownership is going to be super critical. A lot of organizations don't really maintain the ownership of, let's say, the bombs. Uh, the products, I think that data is going to be super critical because that actually drives your production process. That is going to have a lot more implications overall, how much cost is going to go in your manufacturing. Your customer data is going to be super critical. Your vendor data, we both know you have been in procurement space for a long time. 
the majority of the issues that you are going to get is going to be that misaligned vendor data that you have across the system and you don't really have the central state of the vendor data. So what are the enterprise data sets and how to define the ownership? Let's say if I'm the company and if I'm going from, I don't know, maybe $50 million to $100 million to $250 million to a billion dollar, and I need to have some more control overall in my data strategy because initially I was the only one as a CEO who was controlling everything. So I had control on everything. Anytime they wanted to create the vendor, come to the CEO or vendor does not get created. I could control that way. But when I'm a $1 million company, I'm not going to be able to do that. So you need some sort of strategy. So Melissa, what is that strategy in your opinion? Hire a chief data officer. Hire a chief data officer. <laughs> what <laughs> else? Just very simply put, get a chief data officer because that's the new role. That's what they're there. It goes back to ownership. They're ultimately accountable for where that data comes from. But going back to, I think you, you highlighted almost all of it already. It's, it's the, the data. So if you have data in your PLM system, you have somebody that owns the data in that PLM system and they're accountable for pushing that data into the data lake. You've got your consumer data, you've got your parts data, you've got your production parts data, you've got your MPI data, you've got all your research and development data. If you're one of those um, you know, manufacturers that actually creates and patents their, their own parts, you've got your parts catalog list that's coming from all the different suppliers. So now you need to pull in all the data from the supplier and look at all the parts catalogs and all the differentiation you know, piece parts that go into it. I mean, the, the amount of data that that's being used today to make these decisions there's no way that we could make these decisions or make better informed decisions or more specifically make the right decision at the right point in time when it means the most effective for our organization without having a way to pull it all together okay amazing and i'm actually going to add some more points there i think the uh, larger you get i think you are going to have some some sort of you know center of excellence it's going to be obviously if you have money and if you can hire somebody like chief data officer, which is going to be a very exclusive role. And that would probably happen when you are companies like GM or Ford or, but I don't know if the average SMB is going to have a chief data officer. Mm -hmm. So typically what they do is they can create some sort of the center of excellence. And center of excellence is going to have people from different parts of the organization that is going to have a person who understands finance. So my CFO does not go to jail. Okay, <laughs> a person from IT who understand the, who can explain the IT implication. There is going to be a person from procurement because there is not one person in the organization who is going to know the implication of the entire organization. So typically center of excellence is going to be the strategy that most SMB follows in defining, okay, what is going to be master data? And sometimes they might not be using the master data system. Master data management system is a system that helps you create that master data structure in the organization. But if you don't have your processes, if you don't have your systems compatible with your MDM, obviously your MDM system is not gonna work either. So first thing that you need to do is you need to create the master data strategy, okay? Once you have that, then you do master data management system implementation. Okay, so I'm actually going to move to Aaron. Aaron, do you have any follow-up comments on that? Yeah, so Sam, so you actually answered everything. So first, I think from an ownership perspective, you already know, you already know the tools. There, there's there's sales data, right? That who's the owner of sales data? Whoever the heck in, yeah. uh, whoever the heck runs the CRM, right? Yeah. That's the owner. Yeah. Um, so I know, I know, so that's an actual owner. They own it. Everything in there, they own. Anything sales, they own, and they have to work. And so, but. You can never get away from, I've never been able to say, maybe there's some sort of like magical new way of doing things, but old school method of you have an elevation of, you know, if you're going to change the hierarchy of any of my data, uh, of, of any of my reporting tools, or I'm going to add a new data element that's going to be shared across, you have to have a joint session. You have to have a governance session. You have to have you know, the reporting team in place. You have to have the who is ever managing the general ledger or whatever other thing to make sure that I'm not going to break something by using the same the, the same field in other places. So and yep, and it, guess what? It slows everything down. But exactly. that's how you get it right. I if you if if somehow someone has a better way of doing it, that person will be a trillionaire, I and I will happily read their book. But. See, the only correction I would make in that commentary is going to be uh, the data. No, the data, decisions, <laughs> the data decisions are not going to be as binary. Okay, so let's say if you talk about in the binary world, what you are going to think, customer, CRM. CRM is the owner. It doesn't work that way. Okay, because customer is going to reside in many different systems. 
So you need to think about implications in all of those systems. In most cases, if anything is touching the dollar, that's probably going to be your ERP. CRM is going to be owner in case of the customer or the prospect that is before sales or maybe slightly nearer to sales. Anything after that is probably going to be your ERP. Sure, but wherever you flip it into, whenever it flips, right? So you can say, if you want to say the CRM is pre-sale and somehow it flips, I mean, I'm, I apologize. I'm, I, I meant that from a semantics perspective, right? And so, but each one of these, each one of these systems is managed within itself. The marrying of that data, that's one, you get into the trouble because it's, 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 it's matching and interpretation and corrections. And that's where master data management comes in. Yeah, but again, I mean, master data management, implementation of master data management system is not as easy. I have not seen oh, good no. implementation of master data management system, even in, in very large organizations. In fact, if you implement the master data management system, that's actually going to slow down your transactions because now it I has agree. to talk to another system. So it's not as easy as you think, depending oh, on how Oh, I'm not saying it's easy, but how do you, how, how, I, I know of no other way to make sure that the data is correct and that it's using it right. Now, once again, I'm old school. I, we've got a lot of the people here who know a heck of a lot more than me. Maybe there's a different way, but I don't know of no other way to ensure. And it's an imperfect system. Yeah, amazing. Tim, uh, do you have any commentary so far with respect to ownership, data governance? Well, I, I think that there's something to be said for the smaller companies. Um, you know, they're a small organization. It's a whole lot easier to maintain the data, govern the data, um, create the reports, everything, you know, get everything to line up nicely. Um, what I find that happens is as companies get bigger and they start scaling and and the companies that scale the, the fastest, they're the ones that struggle the most with this, is that as they get bigger, these different groups, departments, they want to start, you know, doing things that are special to them in the data, in the they want to get special reports. They want to do special this. They need to pull another piece of software in there that uses this data and manipulates the data. And I see that, you know, a lot of big companies, it's almost like they're too big and it's it's hard for them to get their arms around who owns the data. Because, you know, I've been in plenty of those rooms where it's, you know, we're talking about the database and I, I'm needing access to data and they don't know who to call. And that that's kind of scary. I mean, we're talking a huge uh, international company that they they wouldn't they didn't know who to call. And so to me that it's really important that people, you know, get a handle on on their data, because there are so many companies that operate with bad data and they make poor decisions based on the data or they just it kind of it kind of shocks me. But they just know their data is bad and they just accept that, that, oh, yeah, you know, we know the data is not perfect. It's it's not OK, but we're just going to go ahead and make decisions off of it. And that drives me insane because to me, the data needs to be right. If it's not right, then you need to fix it because otherwise you get a CFO that's, you know, getting a little hot under the collar because his reporting's all bad. But the interesting thing, Tim, is that those companies are still around and they're still profitable. Oh, exactly. Yeah, they they just make enough margin that they can kind of hide some <laughs> of these things. So the question is, is maybe all this, not that this isn't to moot, but it always, it, it takes a lot to actually kill a company. Oh, yeah. A big company, at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, you have not spoken for a while. Commentary, please. Yeah, so a couple comments. I mean, as you talk about master data management, I guess you're really talking about the rules in a, in a data lake and a data warehouse to normalize the data, meaning that yeah. all the customers show up on the same guy, all the items are here, we don't have mis misinterpretation. So I agree that normalization rules in that are, are imperative in terms of having somebody that owns that. But I'll come back to... You know, the entities and the data sets that show up in there. Yeah, you're going to get an ERP data set, a CRM data set. You may have operational system data sets. You may have customer data sets. But I think, you know, Melissa nailed it. It's an aggregation point for all the data. Then you take it up and you structure it and it ends up in the data warehouse. But just a reminder on Data Lake, it's not for small companies. You know, it's it's for large scale. So we come back to that, the enterprise class companies that have lots of data. And, and the other big thing that we're getting out of a Data Lake and that type of a structure is performance, right? You said it. We need the data at the right time. Well, performance and, and, and analyzing billions of records, possibly, and coming up with quick, responsive results, that's part of the user experience. So there's a lot more that's going behind the scenes there. But I think those are some of the positioning on why do you even end up in that in the first place is because you need the performance to serve up the data quickly, accurately, right? We keep talking about accuracy and governance to control both normalization, right rules, who owns customer? Is it ERP? Is it CRM? I got a lot of conversations around that. So 
I'll stop there. Okay. So I am actually going to have a question related to uh, smaller companies. And obviously, we see a lot of smaller companies as well. And I am actually going to refer back the comment that Melissa has made related to doing the reporting in case of an ERP system. As we all know that if you have to create a report, that's probably going to take four weeks, and which is true as well, to be honest. And most ERP systems, I'm not talking about any specific ones, just because it's just hard. It just, uh, ERP systems are not designed for analytics or reporting. The development time is going to be higher, uh, even even if you're doing, let's say, the, the core development. So I would mention an example of a decent size, I would say, a smaller company. They were roughly, what, $60 million, maybe $50 million, not more than that. And then they were had roughly 800 reports on top of their ERP system. And this is very common. This is not just one company that I have seen. Okay, now let's do the math here. 800 reports, 12 weeks. Let's talk about the development time and Aaron, my, my CFO. Okay, so you are going to talk about some dollars here. So how much are we talking about? If we did this in, let's say, in the data lake or data warehouse, what do you think? Will it be cost effective or is it smarter to build 800 reports on top of your ERP? Smarter to do neither. You don't need the 800 reports. Yeah, exactly. And, all right, let's be clear here. Come on. You know I, as well as I that how did that port get created? Someone had a question. So the only way they knew how to answer the question was the one tool that they had. Was, I'm going to build a report. They build a report. That report's never used again, but it's maintained always. Why? It's because no one knows the history of that report. It's like the old tradition of why do we do something? I don't know why. I just did it. My grandmother did it. With a f person, five, five reports from me who role I inherited maintain this report. So I maintain it. And I, and I drop it off in this, this, this dusty old cubicle over here and no one touches. Rinse, lather, repeat. And so everyone's afraid to touch something because no one actually owns the actual data structure and know how anything is created. And then that builds on it. So you get these barnacles as, as all, over, all over your ERP because it's, that's poor ERP management. Yep. So whether or not, so I, I think that the question, it's not, it shouldn't be the question of, should I have 800 really inefficient reports? Or should I spend $10, $50 million on data lake and data management? I think that's a false decision. You should do neither. Not that data lakes aren't good. I'm not saying that at all. But you should have really a fit. You should be very careful with the data that you have and be, and be clear of what am I doing? Am I building a report that's going to be used repeatedly? If so, how and why and who are the users and consistently go back to that? That's your actual report management. And then your analytical layer and making sure that that's maintained appropriately. Easy. All, all this stuff is easier said than done. Easier said than done. But that's my high level rant. So I am actually going to add something more to it. And typically we see the scenario when the ERP is probably going to be misfit for the organization because if the ERP system was really designed for that specific business, they would probably have all of these reports in built in the ERP system. If you are going to have these smaller ERP systems, obviously they are not going to have as many prepackaged reports. And that is the case when a lot of smaller companies, they use QuickBooks and they are going to claim that, you know what, I can scale under, until $300 million because I can live off of QuickBooks. It just works, but you are not counting the development time for those reports. You are not counting the admin time and the dollars that you are spending in managing those reports. So uh, I'm going to say something controversial right now. Why are you using your ERP system to create reports as opposed to taking that data out, putting it somewhere else, kind of what we're getting to here, call it a data lake, call it something else, and using that in a reporting or appropriate reporting tool. An ERP system should be, at least in my mind, used to perform an operational function, not a report. So you are actually agreeing with me, Aaron, but this is what companies do. So thank you so much for agreeing. I, I love it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, okay. it's a recorded show, so savor it. Okay, Chris, go ahead, please. So I think that if you've just got a single system, the reporting can't be surfaced out of the ERP, and again, natively. And again, now why do we need to go to a data lake? Well, the example is if they move from a large on-premise system to a new system, well, all my history is over here. That's right away. Now we got to get a composite view of the world, and the data lake shows up, and that's where all of a sudden we've got two systems. But in a single system, I think you can service out of the ERP directly um, as opposed to building a data warehouse. So just that's just my opinion. Okay, so I think we are going to wrap it up now. Do you guys have any closing advice? Uh, Melissa, I'm actually going to start with you. Yeah, it's data Data is the heart of the organization. And ultimately, to decide where you need to have the data, the goal is to have the data to make the best informed decision. So the right data at the right time 
to make a decision that makes the most difference. So going back to Chris's comment, if you've got one system, then absolutely do it in the ERP. But ultimately, you'll have to scale up to something larger. So wherever it makes sense, the right data at the right time that makes the most difference. Absolutely agreed. Uh, You know, fit is going to be really important. So assess where that belongs and make decisions accordingly. Aaron, uh, I am actually going to move to you. Just one sentence advice. Careful of how much bureaucracy you build around data. And Love it. Chris, closing advice. Look at, take an inventory of what you have and identify the gaps and the information you need to drive your business. That'll lead you there. Love it. Amazing. Tim, closing advice. Yeah, don't create reports just for the fun of creating reports. Absolutely love it. Okay, thank you so much, guys, for joining. Bye, everybody. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests, and hopefully you learned something new today. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Martin Davis, who discusses these strategies to improve your manufacturing facilities capacity and increase the overall equipment effectiveness of your equipment. Also, the interview with Martin Cloak, who discusses different barriers associated with artificial intelligence and Industry 4.0 adoption. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, Please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.